I welcome again to the International Studies Institute lecture series, the theme being uh, Peace from Conflict to Reconciliation. I'm Elaine Brasset, director of the Institute. And um, also welcome to the students. Uh, today's uh, speaker, Bill Stanley, is also the chair of the Political Science Department here. And it's actually a, a pleasure and an honor for me to be able to listen to his work and his research after working with him more on administrative work for uh, a few years. Uh, uh, Dr. Stanley received his undergraduate degree in international relations from Stanford and his PhD in political science from MIT. He joined uh, the University of New Mexico in 1992 and um, has held uh, various uh, administrative positions here including the director of the Latin American um, Studies program and um, Latin American Iberian Institute um, interim director, I think. His work has focused on civil wars, political violence, conflict resolution, and post-conflict reforms to state institutions, including police, military, and judiciaries, with a regional emphasis on Central America. And in fact, he teaches a course on this uh, reconciliation process, so maybe this is just an introduction to work that you could follow up later on your own uh, taking these classes. His first book um, is uh, titled The Protection Racket State, Elite Politics, Military Extortion, and Civil War in El Salvador. And there he examined political dynamics behind the mass killings carried out by the military and police in El Salvador in the 1970s and 80s. His second book is titled Enabling Peace in Guatemala, the story of Minugua, and that came out in 2013. It focuses on the strategies of the United Nations for bringing peace and post-war stability in a context of limited international political leverage, and strong domestic resistance to reform. His work has also been published in journals such as International Organization, Politics and Society, Global Governance, International Peacekeeping, and uh, several others. Now, for the students taking this as a course, uh, he also uh, sent us to read uh, two articles one by Barbara Walter and one by Dr. Mark Pisani and Bill Stanley himself, which responds to the positions of the first paper. And um, the floor is yours. Thank you Thank very you. much. <laughs> thanks very much. Well, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, it's always fun for me to talk about my, my research. I'd rather do that than some of the administrative things that I spend most of my time on. Um, uh, my last two years in college, um, things really came to a head in Central America uh, and really got my attention. Uh, in, in 1979, uh, a, Marxist, uh, a Marxist rebel movement took power in Nicaragua, defeating a, a, a military dictatorship that had been in power for, for uh, many years, since the 1930s. Um, and uh, a uh, uh, civil war also got underway in El Salvador in 1979-1980. Uh, in Guatemala, beginning in 1978, uh, rebel uh, groups started to challenge the challenge governments in in those countries. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, then, in 1982, I, I went off to to uh, graduate school in, in in Boston, planning to study arms control and defense policy. I was at MIT, and that was one of the things that they did. Um, and these were the Reagan years, and there was a lot of talk about nuclear policy and whatnot, so I was very interested in that. Um, but Central America kept getting my attention because refugees from El Salvador were showing up in, in Boston in the dead of winter when it's 35 and raining. Now, how many of you have been in Central America? Okay, so how often is it 35 and raining in Central America? This is not a hospitable place. The, you know, this was a period of, low, of high unemployment, extremely difficult to get housing, shitty weather, excuse my French, uh, in, in Boston. And, I, and all these Salvadorans are showing up in Boston, of all places, which kind of got my attention. It's like, why are people leaving El Salvador to come to Boston? Um, 
And that ended up being my first substantial research project in, in graduate school. Um, I wanted to understand why so many Salvadorans were leaving. Uh, and why then? Uh, and uh, the official line was, well, they're economic migrants, just like people who come here from Mexico. Um, but the surge and the timing of the surge seemed puzzling, as well as their choice of where to go, um, <clears throat> as well as the circumstances under which they were living. So uh, I did a, 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 a statistical analysis, a kind of econometric analysis of the flow of Salvadorans entering the United States and being arrested by what was then the INS, the Immigration and Naturalization Service. Um, and I found that you could predict to a very high degree of certainty the numbers of Salvadorans being captured entering the United States based on the number of people who had been murdered in El Salvador three months earlier. So in, in, the, in the kind of language you hear in economics about leading economic indicators, murder in El Salvador was a leading indicator of Salvadorans showing up in Boston. Um, and that was my first that paper, was my first, uh, my first publication. And one of the things that I noticed in the process of doing that was that the patterns of violence in El Salvador were, were very puzzling. Uh, because the periods when the government forces were killing the most people were the periods when uh, there was actually some possibility of resolving the conflict. In other words, there was some significant overture towards negotiation. Uh, moderate politicians had proposed compromises, et cetera, and uh, the, the, the response of the armed forces was to kill people, and they were particularly targeting moderates, which I thought was very strange. So that, ended up, that led to my dissertation project, which investigated the targeting, the timing, uh, and, and the intensity of violence used by the Salvadoran military, trying to understand what was the logic behind it, because it didn't seem to be responding to what the rebels were, were doing. Uh, which is what theory at the time would have, would have told us. So anyhow, that's how I sort of got into this. Um, <clears throat> I want to give you, you know, I would love to give you a lecture on all three civil wars in, in Central America and how all three of them were resolved, because they were, at long last, all resolved uh, and, and led to reasonably peaceful outcomes, um, which it's important to stay, say doesn't always happen with civil wars. There are some civil wars that last for a very long time, and they proved to be very resilient and difficult to settle. These are wars that were, in fact, ultimately settled uh, and uh, with problems, but with a reasonable degree of success. Um, so I think of the three, the, the Salvadoran case is the most successful. Uh, and even though I'm sort of fresh from writing on the Guatemalan case, I'm going to really stress the Salvadoran one. Um, <coughs> But to set the context, I've got to tell you a little bit about Nicaragua, just so you have the sense of what was going on there. So in Nicaragua, there was a, um, a really a personalistic dictatorship, the Somoza regime, uh, which was basically a sort of organized crime regime. The, 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 the government existed to extract resources from the public, uh, and it eventually alienated essentially all, asp all sort of strata of society, the elites, the popular classes, were all sort of against the regime. Um, and this finally led to an insurgency called the Sandinista Movement, which received its weapons and support, interestingly enough, from the Tor Torrijos regime in Panama and from Venezuela. Not the usual suspect, Cuba or Vietnam or anything. It was from neighboring countries. Um, and the Sandinistas challenged the government, and eventually in the final months, uh, the Sandinistas knew they were winning because they would capture National Guard troops, the, the official government forces, and they would have civilian clothes on under their uniforms. And they realized, okay, these guys are getting ready to ditch their uniforms and sort of blend in. Uh, and that's when they knew they were about to win. Finally, in, in, in July and August 79, they, they defeated the, 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 the government, took over. And so you have a new Marxist-Leninist regime established in, in Nicaragua. Well, a lot of people from El Salvador had gone to Nicaragua to help with the fight. And so in Nicaragua, the new revolutionary regime in Nicaragua decided, you know, we should return the favor. Um, and so they didn't send troops, but they did send weapons um, to the opposition movement in El Salvador. Now, uh, <clears throat> the, the US, in response, decided to punish the Sandinistas. Uh, and we began what was called the Contra War for the contra-revolutionaries. 
and I won't go into the details of this, but basically the United States created a paramilitary force um, and it was based in Honduras and in Costa Rica and it began invading Nicaragua and attacking government facilities, health clinics, police posts, any target they could pick off um, and uh, uh, essentially sort of harassing the Nicaraguan government. Uh, and so in a sense, Nicaragua had two civil wars. It had the first one to overthrow Somoza, and then it had the second one of, of the counter-revolutionaries funded by the U.S. who were harassing uh, the government uh, throughout, the 19, throughout the 1980s. All right, so moving now to El Salvador. So that's a background because this is an important um, context for what happens then in El Salvador. El Salvador's political problem was a little bit different. It did not have a personalistic regime, it had an institutionalized military government. In other words, the military governed, it had an official party, uh, it held elections, it won the elections, amazingly enough, um, under conditions that competition was not encouraged, so shall we say. Um, there were three instances where opposition parties managed to win elections uh, and, and they were immediately overthrown by coups. So there was this kind of balancing act that the military tried to strike of having the legitimacy of holding elections and having the appearance of it being a democracy, but in fact they never allowed the outcome to get away from them. Uh, and if elections didn't go their way, there would be a coup d'etat and they put, put in their guy. All right? The most violent instance of this happened in 1977. There was always some, you know, thuggery by the military when this happened, uh, but there was a particularly violent instance in, in 1977 when uh, the, the opposition candidate uh, appeared, appeared to have won the election, the vote count was stopped, um, the ballot boxes were stuffed, and I know that's true because you know, a lot of people in interviews confess to say, yeah, we stuffed the ballot box. Um, uh, and uh, the, the military announced that their candidate had won, in response to which the public made this huge demonstration in the plaza in, in downtown San Salvador, um, and the government's response was to surround it, um, begin firing on the crowd, and then firing on people as they tried to run through the gauntlet of the streets through, through which they could escape. Um, and some hundreds of people were killed, stacked into trucks and driven off and buried in mass graves. All right, up to this point, the opposition in El Salvador had been nonviolent, it had been protests, uh, a lot of it was organized by the Catholic Church. Um, but after 1977, a lot of people who were in the opposition said, okay, enough. <laughs> you know, there's no longer, there's no longer a nonviolent option. And people started to take arms. And they started to organize clandestine cells um, to, to begin to resist the government militarily. Um, <clears throat> In 1979, in October of 1979, a bunch of junior officers, sort of captains for the most part in the army, looked around and realized that what was going on was not sustainable. That there was this growing opposition in society, increasingly intense popular opposition, uh, and increasing violence coming from the left. And they had observed the Somoza regime collapse in July in, 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 in Nicaragua. And they said, okay, we need to not do the same thing here. So they carried out a progressive coup, a reformist coup, where they basically removed the president who had been put in power by the army and uh, brought in a group of civilians uh, who were uh, more liberal in their thinking, who wanted to hold elections, uh, who wanted to reduce the amount of repression that was being directed at, at, at workers and, and peasants. Um, <clears throat> and they began negotiating with the left to see if there was some way that they could find a way forward to avoid a civil war. Um, these reformists were basically outmaneuvered by hardliners within the army, people in the, national, in, the, in, the, in the national security services, the intelligence services, set about killing people, particularly the moderates who were the negotiating counterparts of the junior officers in the military, and they basically vetoed a Pacific solution by picking off uh, uh, the, the civilians who were supporting that idea, and including some of the military officers who were trying to pursue a uh, moderate, uh, a reformist solution, uh, were murdered. Um, things escalated in, in March of 1980, as I'm sure you know, uh, the Archbishop of San Salvador was, was, was murdered, was assassinated while saying mass. 
uh, and uh, a number of other uh, prominent uh, moderate uh, figures were, were murdered. And at that point, uh, people who had been protesters decided in mass that they were going to join a rebel army. So a lot of the people in the left fled the capital city, went out into rural areas, and began training to become guerrillas. Uh, Nicaragua's response was to send weapons smuggled through Honduras on semi-trailer trucks and across the Gulf of Fonseca right here um, and landed in small boats on the shore of San Salvador. And those weapons were smuggled in and they basically formed an army uh, in the highland areas of, of El Salvador up, up along the Honduran border. And in January 1981, the rebels launched the, what they called their final offensive, which turned out to just be the opening act of a very long war. Um, this war went on throughout the 1980s. Um, something on the order of 75,000 civilians were killed, most of them by government forces. Not all of them, but the vast majority were killed by government forces. The FMLN rebels did target civilians under some instances. They were particularly targeted uh, some wealthy uh, landowners and business people, and they also targeted mayors who were from the centrist or right-wing parties. Um, but most of the killing was done by the, by the, by the rebels. Um, the US, remember this is the Reagan administration. It's the Cold War. We're worried about the Ruskies. Um, and so we uh, provided uh, massive military aid to the Salvadoran army in hopes that it could withstand the rebel challenge and uh, not go the way of the Somoza regime in Nicaragua. A lot of that aid took the form of providing them with an air force. Uh, we, we provided them with dozens of helicopters and attack jets, um, which enabled them to attack the FMLN rebels on the ground uh, anytime they formed a large group. So let's say around 1982 or so, um, the, the rebels would form entire battalions, you know, five or 600 troops. They would collect a bunch of trucks, and they could, they could do major, engage in major land battles against the army, and they were usually winning those. Um, then we gave the Salvadoran army uh, an air force, and they could easily attack those large formations. Uh, and that sort of stopped the advance of the FMLN, and it forced them to break their fighters up into groups of sort of 12 or 15 and scatter them around the country. And they basically shifted their strategy from directly challenging the army in large battles to sort of picking at the army, raiding posts, blowing up bridges, uh, engaging in acts of sabotage, and occasionally massing their troops, generally at night, to attack bases. Um, so uh, it, it, the, the, the war kind of moved into this indecisive phase where because the FMLN had broken up into small groups, it was almost impossible for the army to get at them. They would send raids into the northern El Salvador where the rebels' bases were, and the rebels would know they were coming, and they would just flee. And they usually went into Honduras, where there's a border dispute. There's some disputed territory here that had not at that point been settled legally. So the Salvadoran army didn't want to pursue them into territory that Honduras claimed, because they didn't want to get into another fight with Honduras, especially in the middle of a civil war. Um, so the, in effect, the rebels had a rear base where they could hide out in Honduras. And there was basically nothing the army could do about it. Um, and so the war kind of settled into a stalemate in the, in the middle of the 1980s, where neither side could really get the upper hand, but where it was de definitely going on uh, and would periodically be fairly intense, such as when the FMLN you know, massed forces snuck in and blew up most of the Air Force on the ground, which caused the US to have to replace it. Um, so it was, a, it was, a, it was an, an intense, sporadic, but ultimately stalemated conflict. Um, so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Guatemala later, but I think what I want to do right now is just stay on, stay on, 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 on course here. So the key, the key is that um, this was not an easy war to settle because it, it, it was very bitter. It went on through all of the 1980s. Um, casualties were high uh, on both sides. Um, and... Uh, there was, 
really no reason for either side to trust the other. Uh, so in the, you know, so I want to pause for theory a little bit. The, those of you who are, uh, who are students read an article by Barbara Walter, the title of which is The Critical Barrier to Civil War Settlement. And the argument of that article is that um, international wars and civil wars are fundamentally different. In, a, in an international war, if you reach an agreement, the two sides can retreat to their respective countries and be okay. Um, in a civil war, one side has to disarm and live under the control of the other uh, and be very vulnerable to, to being picked off either in a wholesale attack or you know, just having their leaders and, and members assassinated piecemeal. And this is not, this is not an imaginary fear. I mean, in Colombia, one, one of the former armed groups chose to disarm and become a political party and compete in elections, and many of them were elected to the legislature. And over five to seven years, most of their leadership were murdered. Uh, and many of their members were murdered. And you kind of go, OK, that's a real threat. Um, this, is not, this is no joke. So Barbara Walters' argument is basically the only way you can civil, uh, uh, settle a civil war is to ha either have power sharing, where both the, the the rebels and the government are present in the army and in the police in substantial numbers, where they can kind of monitor one another's behavior uh, and thereby ensure the safety of those who have disarmed as rebels. Um, or you have to have an armed international guarantor, um, which is typically conceived of as an armed peacekeeping force that you know, goes in and, and, and keeps a lid on conflict and, and protects, physically protects uh, 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 members of the opposition who are disarming. Um, well, spoiler alert, El Salvador's civil war was settled without either of those conditions. Uh, and, uh, you know, yes, there was a tiny bit of power sharing in the police, which, I'll, uh, which I will get to, um, but uh, there was never any armed guarantee for the safety, no armed peacekeepers. The observers that were sent by the UN United Nations were unarmed. Uh, and uh, you know, it, and it ended up working out. So, you know, how, how could the FMLN, the, the rebels, have the confidence to put down their arms, become politicians, drive around town in cars, and take cell phone calls, and go to meetings, and go home, you know, for those who are kind of the rank and file, either go back to the city and become industrial workers in places that they left 10 years ago to go be fighters, or go back to farm in a community that they lived in before they went off to become a fighter. How could they have the confidence uh, to, to do that? So what I want to do is try to explain to you how I think this was possible. What were the elements? What was the process that led to a, a, a settlement of this very bitter, very violent civil war uh, being possible without any armed guarantees for uh, the, the party that was disarming? Um, now, a first piece of this is that beginning in the early 1980s, the United States which was the main provider of aid to the government, insisted that it transition to an elected government. And I emphasize elected, not democratic, because initially it was a little bit of a formality. There was an election in 1982 for a, a constituent assembly, uh, and US TV stations sent reporters down to monitor this very exciting event of election in 1982. You know, El uh, Albuquerque's TV station sent reporters to have, you know, authentic Albuquerque footage of the long lines of voters uh, waiting in the polling places. Uh, and there was a lot of happy talk about, oh, look how big the turnout is, and this is wonderful, and look at this celebration of democracy in El Salvador. Well, first of all, voting was mandatory. People carry in El Salvador something called a cedula, it's a personal ID card, and you have to have it marked when you vote. And if your cedula isn't marked after an election, um, you're viewed as maybe being a rebel or some kind of, of troublemaker and you can end up in jail or worse. Uh, so, uh, and the other thing that's interesting about this is that it resulted in the election of, uh, a, a, the plurality of votes went to a right-wing party called ARENA, the National Republican Alliance, uh, and specifically 
uh, this meant that the president of the assembly was going to be a man by the name of Roberto Dalbuisson. And Dalbuisson was a, a, a guy who had been removed from the military because he was too violent. <laughs> he was known as Blowtorch Bobby in reference to his favorite um, interrogation technique. Um, this is guy, was a, he was a death squad organizer, and he was going to become president. All right? So the U.S., naturally enough, being big supporters of democracy, decided this was not an acceptable result. And so we, we, sent, delegate, we sent envoys down to El Salvador, and we met with the military high command, and we explained to them that it's simply unacceptable for Dabwesan to take office. Um, and it was arranged for someone else to be the interim president. So, so the initial step for democracy was much criticized because, okay, you held an election, you got a result you didn't like, you fixed it. Um, <coughs> uh, thereafter, uh, uh, other elections produced uh, a, a majority for a more moderate party called the Christian Democratic Party, which is t similar to uh, centrist parties in Europe. Uh, anti-communist, but in favor of social reforms and social programs, some concern for social equality, social equity, um, but, but not, really, strictly speaking, part of the left, and willing to cooperate with the United States in fighting the FMLN. And subsequently, uh, a president uh, by, the, by the name of Napoleon Duarte was elected, again, from the Christian Democratic Party. Um, so how does this lead to a situation that sets up the possibility of peace. Well, the, the right-wing party, ARENA, learned from this experience that they couldn't just be death squad extremists, that they had to actually kind of moderate their political position, become a serious political party. Um, and so they kind of, they, they, they reshaped themselves as kind of a pro-business, more moderate, uh, uh, center-right party. Um, and they were able to win election finally in 1989 to both the presidency and to having a majority in the legislature. So the reason this is really significant was that throughout Sal uh, Salvador's history, really since the time of independence, the upper classes, the business classes, the big landowners, etc., had always depended on the military to look out for their interests. But through this experience of, of run, competing in elections in the 1980s, by 1989, Arena, the business class, had finally figured out how to win power for themselves. And they weren't dependent on the army uh, to, to put them in power. Uh, and this turns out to be a significant, necessary condition, I think, for, uh, for, what, for what follows. The new president, Alfredo Cristiani, again, from this party that used to be a death squad party, remember, used his inaugural address to promise that he would negotiate an end to the war in El Salvador. All right? So he sends a signal, a strong signal, like his presidency is going to be about ending the war, which is not necessarily what you expect from the right. Um, and, you know, what's going on here is that the business community in El Salvador sees an opportunity, trade, bar trade uh, barriers are being lowered, there's beginning to be significant economic growth throughout the Caribbean basin, um, and they can't really get on board that because they've got a civil war going on, and they want to get on with business. Uh, the war is not good for them. Um, so the response to an initial round of talks between Alfredo Cristiani um, and the, not, his delegate and, and the rebels was that um, the army blew up the headquarters of a labor union that uh, was affiliated with the rebels. Um, and and then the high command held, of the military held a press conference. It was televised where the commanders of every brigade, as well as you know, the, the minister of defense, the vice minister of defense, all lined up at a table with all of their stuff and their big hats and announced that uh, they would never support negotiating with terrorist criminals. So they basically sent a signal Absolutely not. This is not going to happen. All right. The rebels' response was to carry out the biggest offensive they'd carried out at any point in the war. And they carried it out in a very clever way. Instead of attacking military posts all over the, all over the country, they infiltrated the capital cities right there, 
it's not a very good map, but um, they, they infiltrated the capital city. Here we go. Over a couple of months, they had smuggled into the capital city enough weapons to arm their troops. So that all the stuff was pre-positioned in the, in, in the city. And then the rebels just rode to town on buses, just like they were, you know, market traders. Got on a bus, out, you know, they got on buses out in Sonsonate or Santana, Chalate, wherever they were. And they rode, rode into town in San Salvador. They attended social functions. Basically, people held parties in their houses. And at the appointed hours, they went and got, appointed hour, they went and got their guns. And they started attacking the Air Force Base, the Presidential House, the military bases all around the city, um, and basically attacked the city from within. Um, it was a stunning tactical move. Um, and uh, it, it shook the army very dramatically because of massive intelligence failure. I mean, all the journalists, all the humanitarian workers, a lot of people in El San Salvador knew about this beforehand. Uh, and uh, uh, the army apparently didn't or wasn't prepared to do anything about it. Um, so the result was uh, a great embarrassment to, uh, to the army. Then the army's response to this event in the middle of the offensive was to send a, a, a group of, of troops to the, the Jesuit-run University of Central America in San Salvador, and they dragged six professors who were Jesuit priests out of their house at night and murdered them. And then they took a can of spray paint and painted FMLN on the wall like that would fool anybody as to who had done this. Uh, and uh, then proceeded to pretend that you know, they had had nothing to do with it. Of course, everyone knew, it was very clear, very quickly, that the army had committed this, this crime. Uh, and this had a tremendous political impact because you know, the US Congress had been funding that army. Um, and after 10 years, at this point, 12 years of fighting, you're still killing priests? Really? Um, so it, 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 it meant that although the funding was not shut off immediately, it was going to be shut off. And uh, the, the, the US began to taper off its, its funding for the Salvadoran army, so they would not be able to keep fighting at the level of intensity that they had been. All right. Um, this was not an unalloyed victory for the FMLN, however. They lost a tremendous number of troops uh, because the, the army had this air force and they had all these attack helicopters, uh, and they have night vision, and they were basically able to circle the areas of the city that the FMLN had taken over, and they just fired rockets on them and machine gunned them all night, every day, for 10 days, and killed very many of them. Uh, and finally, the FMLN threw in the towel and had to retreat from the city. In the process of retreating, um, one of the groups moved into the western, sub, the western side of San Salvador, right up against the San Salvador volcano, um, which is the rich part of town. And so they occupied the ho homes of rich people. Um, and in the middle of this, weird things happened, like they got to sit down. In, they were occupying people's houses. Um, and the army was afraid to come in because they didn't want to kill the people that were their main political supporters. Uh, and so it was kind of a stalemate. And so they got to have conversations, direct conversations between rebel mid-level commanders and very wealthy people, many of whom were member, members of, a, of the ruling party. So from never having any conversations with one another and, and, have, and sort of viewing one another as sort of beasts, uh, they sat down, in some cases over bottles of rum, and had some serious conversations about what do you guys really want? So there's this weird kind of negotiation that took place in the middle of the offensive in, in next to swimming pools in rich parts of the town. The other thing that happened was that the, the FMLN occupied two floors of a hotel that's in this wealthy part of town in which um, a group of US Special Forces trainers, Army Green Beret trainers, were, were lodged. Um, and in which the Secretary General of the OAS just happened to be there at that moment. Um, basically trapped in a hotel with the rebels, you know, a floor above and a floor below. Now, how do you deal with a situation like this? We don't want this to turn into a bloodbath. We don't, you know, the U.S. didn't want our troops to get killed. Uh, we didn't want the Secretary General of the OAS to get killed. 
Uh, and so this required direct talks between the US and the FMLN rebels. Again, something that had not happened up to this point. They were just our enemy, we don't talk to our enemy, they're terrorists. So you, they got on the phone with one another and they had you know, direct conversations about, okay, how do we defuse this situation? Because we do not want to, the FMLN said, we do not want to kill Americans. And you know, the Americans are saying basically, you know, if you mess with our people, we're gonna come down on you hard. Uh, we don't want to do that, you don't want us to do that, so how do we work this out? So direct conversations, a plan was laid out for the FMLN to retreat from the area without being fired on, the US troops were safe, the Secretary General was extracted, uh, and everybody was okay. Um, so the point is, this weird thing happened in part of, in, in part of, as part of the, 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 the offensive, uh, that direct contacts were possible uh, between the rebels and rich people and the rebels in the US. And that direct face-to-face -face contact was important. All right, in the wake of this, both sides realized, okay, we've got to end this, and neither of us is going to win. Because this was a maximum effort for the FMLN, and they lost about a third of their troops in this fight. Um, and uh, the army had been shown to be basically incompetent, such that they lost a lot of the political support that they had had from the upper classes. Uh, and the upper classes started to think, you know, we should just negotiate with these people and make a deal and get this done. Um, so both sides, the, the government and the FMLN, independently approached the United Nations and said, help us end this. Uh, and they held an initial meeting in, in Geneva in April of 1990. So, you know, this is just a few months, five months after the, the big offensive in April, in, 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 in November. Uh, and they agreed to hold talks under UN auspices that would be continuous and secret. Now the continuous is important because one of the strategies that, that opposing sides often use in, in peace negotiations is just to stop talking and back off and just refuse to play. And so they made a prior commitment, we will continue to talk until this is done. And the secrecy is also important because remember there are constituents on both sides that, you know, would not be happy with some of the compromises that anyone at the table would have to make. I mean, if you're negotiating, if you're the negotiator at the table representing the rebels, for example, and you're talking with the government, they're going to want you to make some sacrifices. They're going to want you to make some concessions. Um, and some of the people that support you as a rebel are not going to be happy with that. So you have to be able to negotiate in secret so you can make progress without various constituencies saying, hell no, we can't do that. So, uh, so they made two key con you know, co commitments from the get-go, secrecy and continuity and, and, and UN uh, 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 facilitation. They then they met uh, a month later in Venezuela at Caracas. And this is typical of these peace talks. They're held in various cities, various countries, neutral ground, outside of the country, uh, where, where you know, the parties are, 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 can feel safe. Um, so the next one, was, as I said, was in Venezuela. And they basically laid out an agenda. And it was a really sweeping agenda. It was, it was no kidding, you know, what needs fixed? What needs to be fixed in El Salvador? Uh, so it was a list that included uh, reforming the armed forces, protecting human rights, reforming the judicial system, reforming the electoral system, constitutional reforms that would establish clear civilian supremacy, because the existing constitution basically allowed the, gov the military to, to, to get involved itself in all kinds of things. Um, and various socioeconomic reforms, and finally verification, uh, that is making provisions for someone, probably the UN, to verify what was going on. And particularly the FMLN wanted guarantees for their own safety, guarantees that their political rights would be restored, uh, and some kind of plan for their reintegration into society, because remember, a lot of them have been fighting for, for, for by this point, a dozen years. Um, <coughs> the next meeting was in San Jose, Costa Rica uh, in July of 1990. So, you know, again, just a couple of months later. And this was an agreement on human rights, where the government committed to absolutely protect individual rights so that people could not be dragged out of their houses and beheaded by the police, uh, which had happened to tens of thousands. Uh, and it looked really radical because, you know, this is, you know, major promises to protect human rights by a state that had not been doing so. But in fact, legally, it didn't commit the government to do anything that it wasn't already legally committed to do. They had already signed all the key international and inter-American human rights conventions. They were just violating them. Um, 
But what was significant about this was that it provided for United Nations verification, that the, the United Nations would be able to go anywhere, anytime, without prior notice, and look to see whether you have a prison in the basement of your police post. Uh, so it, 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 it it agreed to, the, the government made a, a significant concession by agreeing to a very intrusive type of inspection where UN human rights investigators would be able to go into any military base, no matter how secret, at any time without prior notice, and look in to see whether there were political prisoners, be, people being tortured, etc. Um, in fall 1990, just to keep the pressure up, the FMLN launched what they called their mini offensive, which was designed to be kind of a reminder of the November offensives. Like, we're still here, we're still military, militarily potent, don't forget that we can mess with you if you don't continue to negotiate. So it's kind of a, uh, on one hand, they're negotiating, and the other hand, they're kind of hitting the government with a stick to remind them that they're, that they're serious. Um, and they made one significant change, which was that for the first time, they introduced anti-aircraft -wep anti weapons. Now this is a war where the, the, the government's main advantage had been that they had helicopters and airplanes. And the FMLN had chosen deliberately not to purchase or obtain shoulder-fired anti-aircraft weapons, um, which are very effective, um, because they felt doing so would invite U.S. intervention. And they didn't want a heavier U.S. intervention. So they had, they had sort of, they had limited themselves. And you know, many of the casualties that they took, for example, in the November offensive, were the result of their not having anti-aircraft weapons. So they were basically sitting ducks on the ground. Well, in 1990, they introduced anti-aircraft weapons, shoulder-fired uh, missiles, that, uh, and they shot down a couple of aircraft. That's all it takes to you know, shoot down a couple of aircraft, and the Air Force basically stopped flying. Um, uh, unless aircraft are equipped with, with these little flare dispensers that can spoof uh, shoulder-fired weapons, uh, they're very vulnerable to shoulder-fired uh, anti-aircraft weapons. And so the Salvadoran Air Force basically were made most of the time on the ground, or they flew at very high altitudes where they would be safe from those missiles, but also not really able to do much. Um, this changed the military balance. All of a sudden, the FMLN could f gather its forces in large formations once again, uh, and there were a couple of uh, intense land battles uh, in uh, late 90, uh, 1990 and early 91, uh, where, in one case, a battalion of the Salvadoran army was forced into Honduras, where they were disarmed and arrested by the police with their little pistols. Which gives you an idea, you know, that the, the, the FMLN had sort of gained suddenly the, the upper hand. Uh, the army was less willing to be aggressive on the ground because uh, they no longer had the ability to, to have their wounded removed by helicopter. Uh, and so the, the, the military balance suddenly shifted in favor of the FMLN, even though they were much smaller. Um, so yes? This, was called a civil war period, this is still the war. This is still the civil war. Yeah, they're still fighting. Yeah, so they're negotiating, they're negotiating in various cities, and, and at the same time, there's a contest on the battlefield to gain the upper hand with the idea that that's going to influence the track of the negotiations. Exactly. Yeah. I hope that, yeah I'm sorry that wasn't clear about that. So there, yeah, the, it's, it's, it's kind of a strange situation because you've got talks going on, but no ceasefire at this point. In fact, it's actually intensifying a bit. Um, so uh, in April 1991, so this began, remember, in April 1990. So a year after the beginning of the talks, they met in Mexico City. Um, to hammer out details of constitutional reforms. And this ends up being really critical for reasons that I will explain. Uh, they, they, they agreed to a series of reforms that established civilian supremacy over the military, that re reconfigured the courts so that they would be less politicized, more independent, more, more uh, professional, less sort of a product of partisan control. Um, uh, they fixed various problems with the electoral system or proposed fixes for this. Uh, and they finally, they provided for what was called a truth commission, which would be an investigation of human rights abuses that took place during the war that would be issued after the, the, the war stopped. There would be a sort of truth-telling process to say who did what to whom, uh, and it kind of established an official record of what, uh, what crimes had been committed. Um, the key thing about that agreement 
was that the, the, the National Assembly, the Legislative Assembly, immediately approved it by a very high ratio and the, all the entire ARENA delegation voted in support of the constitutional reforms. So this was the first signal, real serious signal to the FMLN that ARENA as a political organization intended to stop the war and they intended to actually go ahead with reforms. Uh, the reason it was critical that they approved it uh, uh, in, immediately is that the Salvadoran procedures for constitutional reform required that two consecutive sitting legislatures, it would be the equivalent of two Congresses in the U.S., have to both approve it. So you have to have you know, one, one, one legislature has to approve it, then there has to be an election, and then the next legislature has to approve it before it can go into effect. And this legislature, they were lame ducks, they were almost done, um, and they approved it. So if, had they not done that, that would have meant it would have been it would have been three years before it was possible to implement constitutional reforms. Their doing so made it possible to, to achieve actual implemented constitutional reforms within a, a, a reasonable time frame. They could happen within a year or two. Um, and it was a very strong signal uh, uh, to, to the FMLN that ARENA meant business. It would have been very easy for ARENA to just say, sorry, short notice, we just can't get to it, you know, it wasn't on the agenda, whatever. They could have dodged this very easily, but they didn't. They supported it, and that signaled the FMLN that they actually meant business. Then, uh, three months later, uh, the UN deployed a human rights mission to El Salvador called ONUSAL. That was the acronym for it. And basically, that was what had been provided for by the human rights agreement. They, they, they deployed uh, a few hundred human rights observers, most of, most of them attorneys uh, or, or people who had been human rights advocates in Latin American countries, uh, um, some Europeans, uh, and they set up offices around the country and they brought them their little white jeeps with the little UN logo on them and they started driving around the country being underfoot. Going into police stations, going to military bases, checking in on FMLN bases, um, and monitoring human rights conditions. People came to them with complaints, they would go out and investigate it, and so they were, they were actively monitoring human rights conditions, and from the, point of, from the military point of view, they were in the way. You can't have an all-out firefight with the UN underfoot. Uh, and so it kind of dampened the intensity of the war. So even though at this point there wasn't a ceasefire, the presence of the UN human rights investigators uh, kind of dampened the intensity of the conflict. You couldn't start lobbing mortar into a town with the, with the UN underfoot. Um, so it, it, it really, this, that was sort of the inflection. That's when the war really began to wind down because uh, you had human rights monitoring going on so people felt safer and uh, it was more difficult for either side to fight. Yes? Were they monitoring complaints of the current time? Yes. Then, or yeah. They were mainly, yeah, they, would get, they left the historic, like what had done, been done five years ago or whatever, they left that to the Truth Commission. So they were investigating what's going on right then. So they were, you know, which meant they were going to, they were going to police stations, they were looking for political prisoners, uh, they were checking the case files of people who were in prison on political charges. A lot of them were released because there were no charges or the charges were just made up, or what have you. Um, all right, so this is a key turning point. Um, but they still had an impasse. And this is where Barbara Walters' argument is still really salient because the, the, the FMLN basically said, uh, you know, we want to be incorporated into the army or we want the army to be abolished. Choice one, choice two. We're in the army or the army's gone. Now, obviously from the government's point of view, neither is acceptable because the FMLN had, after all, formed an insurgency and fought the government for, for a decade. They were not willing to abolish the army. And the level of distrust was so high, the idea of having the FMLN in the army was just anathema. And the army was threatening to carry out coups if that were the case. It was just, it was just a non-starter. There was no way they could do that. And the FMLN's view was, how else are we going to survive? Why else would we expect that we wouldn't just be picked off if we're not in the army or if the, or if the army isn't abolished? So that was the impasse. <clears throat> um, this impasse was broken in September in, in New York, in 1991, by a proposal to leave the army as it was, but downsize it and sideline 
Because the problem in El Salvador had been that this, the army was involved in domestic matters, right? They controlled the police, they patrolled the countryside, they, they went out and, you know, if you were in a teacher's union and you were organizing a strike, it was the army or a police force controlled by the army, they would take you out of your home at night and kill you. It was a political force and it was deeply involved in domestic matters. Um, so the proposal was, well, we'll just make the army only exist to protect us from Honduras, right? That will be their only mission. <laughs> and policing will be in the hands of a civilian force created from scratch that would include a minority presence of FMLN, former FMLN people, and from which the army itself would be barred. So only people who are part of the existing national police force um, and, and, and from the FMLN and the majority of people in it would be civilians, people who newly hired into the police. To be a basic patrol, patrolman in the police, you would have to have a high school degree. To be a, a sort of next level, you know, mid-level commander, you had to have three years of university. And to be a commissioner, to be in charge of, say, the police in a, in a, in a, in a province, you'd have to have a full university degree, which in, in El Salvador is a five-year degree. Um, so the idea was they're going to basically, they're going to be hiring lawyers and agronomists and, and people with advanced education, liberal educations, uh, to, to control the police force, and it would be under a civilian ministry. And not only did they propose this concept, but, but the UN had helped draft what's called the organic law, which in the US we would call sort of secondary or enabling legislation, that described in detail how the, the, the police would function, how it would be organized, how it would be regulated. So it was very credible. It was detailed. It was a detailed roadmap of what this new institution would, would look like. And with that, and with the idea that the army would basically stay in their barracks, they could go do peacekeeping operations in Africa, they could protect the country from Honduras, uh, and they would be out of the picture. And the police would be the, the force that actually interacts with the, the public, and it would be under civilian control in the hands of this more highly educated, university educated uh, 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 command structure. Um, with that, the FMLN said, okay, deal. So they, they, they retreated from their demand that they be in the army because the army, with this design, became irrelevant. It didn't matter who was in the army because the army was going to you know, defend them from an attack that's not coming from Honduras. Um, and and the, uh, 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 the, the police would be where the action was and the police would be mostly civilian and the FMLN would have a few people there uh, in the command structure uh, with eyes and ears. Uh, finally, uh, December 1991, final round of negotiations in New York. They kind of wrap up the whole thing. Uh, and the president went up there. A lot of pressure from the US at this point on, on the president to settle. Uh, and they figured out all the final details for implementation, which I'll get to in a minute. And this was signed triumphantly in Mexico City in January of 1992. All right. Now, those of you who know anything about Marxist-Leninist uh, rebel movements may be wondering at this point, what about land reform? What about economic justice? What about workers' rights? What about uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, protecting the rights of peasants to, 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 to organize and form cooperatives, et cetera? That was almost completely excluded from this deal. Now that's very strange, given what the FMLN supposedly fought for, which was social justice. But it, represent, it reflects the political situation. They were negotiating with a private, upper class, business oriented power, uh, political party to sideline the army. So their, their whole political strategy was demilitarization. They're going to they're gonna remove the military as a, as a political factor in El Salvador. And then they would trust in their own ability to compete in elections as being their means to reach you know, the socioeconomic goals that they had. If they had insisted on massive land reform, expropriation of some of the huge land holdings, redistribution, uh, much stronger labor rights, et cetera, if they'd insisted on those things at this point, they probably wouldn't have gotten a deal. As it was, they made a deal with the, with the business party that the business party was willing to do, which was to sell out the army. And that made all the difference because they got a deal and they got the army out of the picture. Um, and it has taken many years for the FMLN subsequently to begin to win elections. But the last two presidents in El Salvador were from the FMLN. Uh, 
And one of them was a civilian who wasn't affiliated with the FMLN during the war, but the one who's the president right now was a rebel commander. You know, he's a guy in his early 70s who was one of the top military commanders of the FMLN rebel force. And he's the president now. So, you know, in the long run, they gained some political power. Um, all right, I want to say a few things about implementation, and then I will stop and take some questions, and then I want to show you a few, a few slides. First of all, um, the most dangerous year was the first year. Um, and this is not uncommon. Uh, the, the, the promise was that the FMLN would concentrate their forces in a series of encampments in different parts of the country. Uh, and those places were chosen for being somewhat distant from army bases, so that the FMLN troops would feel safe from surprise attack. Uh, and then the plan was, in 20% groups, the FMLN would demobilize its troops. And they would, be, they would actually you know, present themselves to UN officials. The UN officials would take their weapons. They would give them paperwork. They would entitle them to, to loans, education, basic household goods, farming equipment for those who were farmers, training for those who wanted industrial jobs, et cetera. So there's sort of a, sort of a guns for stuff <laughs> trade that would happen. And then they would be demobilized and they would go out into the world and they would you know, try to rebuild their lives. Uh, at the same time, in a kind of interlocking schedule, the government was supposed to do certain things, including downsizing the army, demobilizing, eliminating some of the army-controlled police forces that had been especially violent. Um, and uh, uh, they were supposed to, uh, uh, there was a, a, what was called a lustration process. Lustration is the term used in transitional justice for basically purging or purifying uh, a, a government organization in which people have committed human rights abuses. You basically identify who are the, the abusers and you remove them. Uh, so one of the provisions of the, of the peace accords was for a commission that would evaluate the human rights records of military officers uh, and name those who really had to go, who would have to go into retirement and leave the army. Um, <clears throat> and so that process was supposed to be, was supposed to be implemented. Um, moreover, FMLN combatants who had disarmed, who were, who were farmers and who wanted to go back to farming, were, were supposed to be provided with land. Uh, it's, you know, very modest amounts of land, but enough to, to survive on. So all these things were supposed to be implemented, uh, and uh, there were immediate problems. Uh, the government didn't, be, didn't transfer lands. They didn't demobilize the army troops they were supposed to demobilize, and they didn't demobilize the security forces that they were supposed to demobilize. They, the, the, uh, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the most, heinous groups called the Treasury Police. Uh, they just repainted the, the barracks with you know, uh, PM, Policia Militar. So they just became military police instead of being Treasury Police. And the FMLN said, yeah, right. <laughs> That's not what we agreed to. So the FMLN stopped demobilizing. Uh, they had to demobilize one group, and then they said, you know, we're not going to demobilize anymore until you, you know, do what you promised to do. So it was something of a standoff, and the UN had to broker, uh, they had to uh, uh, basically bring in an arbitrator to establish what the rules would be for land transfers to FMLN members and their supporters. Um, and uh, there was a, uh, one of the things that the FMLN did was, was, you know, they had all these anti-aircraft missiles. And naturally enough, the government was rather concerned about their having those anti-aircraft missiles. And they held on to them and said, you know, you can't have the missiles until the people who were named as human rights abusers and who are supposed to leave the army, leave. We're not going to give them over. So there, in January of 93, there was this missiles for generals deal where they <laughs> gave over their missiles in exchange for uh, a number of generals finally, uh, finally retiring. Um, one of the things that happened was that, that you know, the FMLN had, you know, they expected that their top people would get to, you know, run for office and be in the legislature or they would join the police as commissioners or, you know, they, their top commanders had prospects, all right? And the rank and file were getting, you know, farming equipment and land and industrial jobs, and they were more or less okay with their lot. The people in the middle, the people who had been in command of 100, 200 troops who were kind of mid-level executives, 
were being asked to take the same package as the rank and file. And they weren't going to get to run for the legislature and become a deputy or anything. And so they were pretty unhappy. So a bunch of them started to protest and send signals that, you know, we're not going to demobilize uh, unless you do something for us. And this is where the U.S., I think, really was brilliant. The U.S. Embassy at this point, I mean, remember, these were our enemies, right? These were the, this was the, the side we were fighting against for a decade. Um, the response of the embassy was, that's a reasonable request. And we found a bunch of money to give a bigger aid package, a bigger compensation package to the mid-level commanders. Um, so they would be content with their lot and wouldn't be a source of trouble. That was like not what necessarily you would expect from the U.S. Embassy at this time. But you know, the, this was where you know, the Cold War was really over. <laughs> Uh, and the embassy's priorities had kind of shifted and they recognized, look, you know, this needs to end. Uh, and uh, this actually is a reasonable request. These are people who are, in fact, executives. They're expecting, you know, some kind of reasonable standard of living coming out of this. Um, and so they, they agreed to a better, uh, a better um, package. Um, the Truth Commission carried out its work. It issued a report that was really a stinging condemnation of the government's behavior during the closer course of the war. Um, it demanded uh, uh, a series of things, uh, various kinds of compensation for victims, et cetera. Um, I would say it was not well implemented um, in a number of ways. First of all, it was too one-sided in the sense that it investigated the military uh, and it did, I think, very credible reporting on what the military did. And if I have time, I'm going to show you some slides from an exhumation of a massacre site that the Truth Commission uh, uh, carried out. Um, but it didn't investigate what the left had done. And in the left had, in fact, committed some serious crimes. There was one commander in, 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 uh, uh, in, in this area, San Vicente, uh, who um, basically seems to have had a psychological breakdown that led him to see hundreds of people as enemies and informants and spies. And he, he ordered the death of some 600 civilians in the, in the Department of San Vicente. Now, any human rights investigative committee, commission that's worth its salt should have investigated that. Um, and they didn't. What they, basically, they, they basically reported on the things the FMLN admitted to, not the things that had been done that should have been investigated and weren't. Um, I mean, in the end, the, end, in the, end, the FMLN you know, assassinated that individual and replaced him but you know, this problem had been allowed to persist for a very long time, and a lot of civilians had been killed. So that was a real failing. Um, final, two more, two more main points on the, on the implementation process. Um, in May of 1993, an explosion took place in Managua, in Nicaragua, a neighboring country, uh, in, a, in a car repair shop. And the explosion appeared to have occurred in a vehicle that was parked in the garage, and it blew a hole in the cement floor. And through the cement floor, investigators who arrived found a massive underground cavern in which the FMLN was storing weapons and money and ammunition, uh, anti-aircraft weapons, uh, rocket-propelled grenades, etc. So they had enough, it turns out that they had enough weapons there and in various caches hidden in El Salvador to rearm their force completely. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it's pretty clear that the reason they did that was as insurance. <laughs> you know, like they trusted the FM, they trusted ARENA, they trusted the process, but a lot of the rank and file didn't. Like the people who were at the table and they were doing business with ARENA uh, and even with some of the more reasonable members of the army really felt that it was over. But a lot of the rank and file was unconvinced. And so the FMLN had decided, you know, we better keep enough weapons and, and we'll reassure our, 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 our comrades that we've got enough weapons to, to, to protect ourselves if it comes to that. Um, the timing of this, in a way it was fortuitous for the FMLN. Had this happened a year later in the midst of the electoral campaign, it would have been pretty bad for them. Um, but as it turned out, uh, you know, it led to a demand from the government, strongly and reinforced by the UN, okay, now really give us all your guns. And they, and they in fact, really turned over all their guns at that point uh, and were fully and thoroughly uh, uh, disarmed. Um, fortuitously, um, 
the Salvadoran electoral calendar uh, provided for an election to be held in 1994. So two years after the final signing of the peace accords, there was a major election to be held in which municipal, national legislative, and the presidential offices were all at stake. They called them the, 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 the elections of the century because the way the electoral calendar is set up, the terms are different. It's you know, two years for the, the assembly, um, I think it's four years for most mayoral offices and five years for the presidency, if I remember right. So they happen to coincide that year. So you know, after the peace accords were signed and after the FMLN had demobilized and really become civilian political party, they had a chance to actually run for office and test their, test their prospects. Um, so you know, this allowed them to put down their arms and then really see what they could do electorally. Uh, gave them a positive incentive to, to, to go along with this. Um, here again, the UN's presence was really important because the Supreme Electoral Tribunal, which manages elections, was really not interested in facilitating the registration of new voters because the chances are that new voters, people who'd returned from the countryside, people who'd come out of clandestine lives and adopt, gotten their real names back, uh, uh, you know, people who were registering anew to vote were probably FMLN supporters, or there was a better chance that they were FMLN supporters. And the Supreme Electoral Tri Tribunal was run by the parties that already had seats in the legislature. So they weren't interested in adding a new competitor. So all the Supreme Electoral Tribunal staff were kind of dragging their feet, and their offices wouldn't open when they're supposed to open, and they'd say, oh, the copier doesn't work, you know, the, the, the camera doesn't work, we can't help you. Um, and so people weren't being able to register to vote. And it was, it was uh, some phenomenal number of people, it was like 600,000 people or something that, that were, were not uh, registered to vote who were eligible to vote. So uh, the, the UN basically intervened. They, they had their staff basically start picking up uh, Supreme Electoral Tribunal staff at their homes and drive them to work. They brought them generators. They brought them copy machines. They brought them laminating machines. They just, anything they didn't have, anything that was an excuse, they removed the excuse. And they just sort of shamed them into the, doing their jobs. And then they got the word out that yeah, actually the office is open and you can go and register to vote. Uh, and they started providing transportation, helping people get there. Um, and they managed to get maybe a half to two thirds of the eligible people who had wanted to register to be able to register. Um, which allowed the elections to actually be legitimate. Um, the results were that ARENA won uh, the presidency and a majority in the legislature, but not on the first ballot. The, the FMLN candidate came in a very close second and they had to have a, a runoff and a, a Reyna candidate won. Um, but the UN ran a quick count and they kind of warned Reyna, you know, don't claim you won because our results are quick, our, our uh, what do you call it? Ah, oh, come on. When you do a quick survey outside of the polling places. Exit polling, right, thank you. Uh, their exit polling showed that, that ARENA hadn't, didn't quite have the margin, so they shouldn't claim victory, because if they had, it would have been a riot. Um, so the UN really, helped, I think, helped in critical ways uh, during, during, during that period. So the result was the FMLN didn't win power, but they won a respectable number of seats in the legislature. They became a serious player. They continued to contend for power. They won a number of mayoral offices uh, where they, they ran a number of cities effectively and kind of built their political prestige. And eventually, uh, they won the presidency and they, they won it again in the most, in most recent elections uh, in 2014. So, um, you know, this is for the most part a success story uh, in the sense that you go from this very violent, horrific civil war to, you know, one of the more vibrant democracies in, in the region. I mean, the political debate in El Salvador is fun, it's open, it's wide open. I mean, there's the, 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 the talk show debates on Salvadoran TV are way more interesting than the ones in the US. You know, it's really right and really left and real arguments about policy. Um, and and you know, it's, it's safe to be a member of the left, it's safe to be a member of the right. It's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a country now with a broad political spectrum, very vibrant political uh, debate. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it, is, it is, in fact, a democracy. Now, all is not okay in El Salvador. <laughs> um, uh, 
it, it is still very violent there. Uh, and in fact, the violent death rate was higher three years after the war ended than it was during the war because of the amount of crime. Uh, and this illustrates one, I think, significant mistake the UN made uh, in its planning for the transition process, et cetera, was, was that, which was that the original idea for the, national, the new civilian police force um, did not provide for a big enough police force. They imagined, they, they sort of used the ratio, an optimal ratio of police to civilians uh, derived from Spain because the, the advisors were Spanish. Well, Spain is a lot more peaceful than El Salvador. El Salvador has gangs. It has historically had one of the highest homicide rates of any place in, 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 the, in the Western Hemisphere. The, the average homicide rate in the 60s and 70s in El Salvador for the whole country was the same as the homicide rate in the most embattled parts of Washington, D.C. You know, I mean, it's a very violent place. Uh, it needs, therefore, a much more dense police presence. And during the war, you had soldiers, you had National Guardsmen, you had the FMLN in their areas. You had a lot of people with guns sort of patrolling everything. Uh, and when the war ended, you went suddenly down to 5,000 cops for the whole country. And they were rookies, all of them, uh, or most of them. And, uh, and at the same time, you have all these people who were former rebels, former soldiers, former paramilitary, cashier, demobilized, bored. Some of them are adrenaline junkies. Some of them don't really have skills other than fighting. So, you know, if you're bored and you're unemployed and you're poor and you need money and you know how to handle an AK and you've got a grenade and an AK, you rob a bus. It's what you can do. So it got really violent. Um, <clears throat> There had also been this problem that a lot, of, a lot of Salvadorans had left the U.S., I mean, had left El Salvador and gone to the U.S. during, during the war. Um, and a number of them had kids here who kind of grew up in the U.S., but who, or who were brought here very young, um, and uh, who were in poor neighborhoods and kind of endangered. And so a lot of them joined gangs out of self-protection. So the Salvadoran community formed its own gangs to kind of, in places like L.A. and Houston, Chicago, uh, D.C., to, to kind of protect themselves against other gangs in their neighborhoods. Uh, and a lot of these gang members ended up being deported back to El Salvador. And so they show up in El Salvador, they're all tattooed, their Spanish is bad because they speak, you know, LA. They don't speak Spanish Spanish, they speak Los Angeles Spanish or English. Um, they stand out like a sore thumb, they can't get work, no one trusts them. So what do they do? They form gangs. <laughs> Right? And they engage in extortion to protect themselves and to make a living, and things kind of went downhill from there. So there's a lot of communities in El Salvador that are dominated by gangs that are a sort of secondary effect of the war because of their, their, their this, this sort of circular migration effect where people were forced to move to the U.S., isolated, endangered in the U.S., joined gangs in the U.S., and then sort of franchise those gangs back to, to, to El Salvador. So it's a really horrific situation, high, very high homicide rate. Um, the last couple of years, there was a, at one point a truce between two of the gangs, which reduced the violence for a time, uh, but that recently, recently broke down, and the, and the, fight, the fighting is back. Um, all right, so positive lessons here. The, the early deployment, so lessons for the UN and for peacekeepers generally, the early deployment of the human rights mission was a really smart move. Sending Onusal in while the fighting was still going on was a risky move. And the UN saw it as such at the time. There was a lot of debate within the headquarters. Like, is this nuts? I mean, we're going to send in human rights observers, unarmed human rights observers. They're going to drive around the country in jeeps, soft-skinned vehicles in the middle of a war? Really? And the decision was, yeah, let's do that. So they sent them out. As it turned out, no one was killed in violence. There were some, violent, there were some accidental deaths, uh, but, but no, uh, uh, no, no, no combat deaths among these human rights observers. And their presence made a huge difference because it, it ramped down the fighting and it helped provide the FMLN and particularly the membership, the sort of rank and file of the FMLN with a confidence uh, to think they would survive. Um, Another lesson is that you know, demobilization planning is really critical, and it's, just, it's good to be generous with people who are being demobilized as combatants. It is so much cheaper to pay off, say, the mid-level commanders, give them some money so they'll be happy in, in rejoining civilian life, than it is to deal with them if they decide to take up arms again or become organized bandits or something. Um, and, and the reason I bring that up is in Nicaragua, they completely botched that. 
The Contras were asked to demobilize. They were provided with essentially nothing. And a lot of them ended up rearming and becoming bandits uh, uh, and, uh, and even organized uh, guerrillas once again in order to demand some kind of economic uh, help from, from the government. So it was way better organized in El Salvador, really, I think in part because it had been so badly handled in Nicaragua. The UN, USAID, the agencies that were involved realized, you know, it's just worth spending some money in, in getting this organized early so that the former combatants aren't as much of a problem. Um, <coughs> you know, the fact that, the, you know, the fact that El Salvador had something of an electoral tradition was, was critical. The fact that the, the, the extreme party had gone through this process of moderation in order to be electorally successful uh, was, was critical. And I think the design of the police, that, that, was a, that was a really brilliant solution to Barbara Walters' problem. <laughs> You know, that, that you basically just sideline the military and you focus on a new vision for civilian policing. And even though they didn't set the force level correctly, it was too small initially, in general the PNC, the civilian police, has been uh, a very effective uh, uh, institution. Um, and as I've already mentioned, the negative, it, the negative lesson, I think, is that you have to attend to transitional security. I don't think El Salvador would be as violent as it is today had there been a, a better plan for, for providing policing during the two or three years when the old forces were being demobilized or the new forces was be, new force was being created and trained and, field, and put in the field. There needed to be some greater presence, perhaps an international one, uh, that would provide policing and security to keep things uh, from, from snowballing during that phase. So let me stop there and ask what questions you have, because I've, I've jammed a lot of information in here. Uh, yeah. So what other like, international forces were kind of going and helping the rebels? Because you said that the US was kind of helping the government-based military. Um, right. And with the conflict, it's kind of big. Yeah. Kind of this was, this was actually the East Bloc. Yeah. I mean, yeah, unlike, unlike the Sandinistas, who initially got most of their help from Panama and Venezuela, the FMLN got their help largely from the East Bloc through Nicaragua. Um, and and you know, Cuba was also involved as a kind of broker. Uh, they actually, they, they obtained weapons that the US had abandoned in, in Vietnam. Uh, the, basically the, the armament of Arvin uh, was, was crated up and shipped through Cuba, through Nicaragua to El Salvador. And so uh, the, the, the rebels for much of the war were fighting with M16 rifles that the US had left, and we know this by their serial numbers, that we had left behind in Vietnam. Um, that allowed the FMLN to claim, oh, these are just weapons we captured from the army because they're so incompetent. But actually, they were from Vietnam. Um, they, uh, at the end of the day, when they received anti-aircraft weapons, that came from Nicaragua. Uh, uh, and uh, some of their big operations where they, you know, for example, breached the security of, of battalion bases and killed hundreds of people and then retreated at night. Many of those had been practiced in Cuba. Like they had actually exfiltrated their, um, their commanders and, and a good number of the troops to Cuba. And the Cubans set up mock bases using, using satellite photography of, of the Salvadoran Army's bases. They made mock-ups of those in Cuba. And the Salvadoran rebels practiced on those in the dark so they would know how many fence posts before you cut the wire, before you turn left. They had it down to that level of detail. Um, by practicing on mock-ups in Cuba, then they came back into El Salvador and they carried out those raids. So some of the sort of spectacular attacks that the FMLN carried out were, were aided by Cuba. So, yeah. Yes? Yeah, speaking of what uh, helped the FMLN, uh, is it true that the FMLN uh, uh, got, uh, you know, money uh, for fighting uh, from uh, the production of illicit uh, drugs and trafficking, uh, the way the Taliban uh, was, you know, helped uh, in Afghanistan from, from drug production? I'm not aware export. of, yeah, I'm not aware of the FMLN doing that at all. Um, they, they actually were a little bit um, purist about that particular issue. Um, there was some drug money involved in funding the Contras, the counter-revolutionaries in Nicaragua, which was something the US was involved in. Um, but the FMLN was not involved in that. But they were involved in kidnapping. Uh, 
and bank robbery. That was one of the ways they got funding. In fact, one of the things they found in that car shop in, in Managua were plans for kidnapping some senior uh, uh, bank officials in, in Mexico who were members of the PRI, the ruling party in Mexico at the time. And it, so they were clearly willing to engage in criminal activity to fund themselves, but, but drugs were not part of that, to my knowledge. Uh, and in fact, the Salvadoran army was more involved in drug trafficking, and that was basically, they were, at, they were sort of an auxiliary to the operation to fund the Contras. Um, they used their air base, et cetera, for moving cocaine in some instances. Um, uh, one of the things that I think helped make the war, it, make it possible to settle the war in Central America is there was not a major lootable resource of that kind. I mean, you compare it to Colombia, you know, where where, where uh, the FARC sits astride in a major coca growing area, and they just they have a revenue stream from that um, that is really independent. Uh, some of the some of the insurgencies in, in in Africa, same thing. I mean, they've got they've got diamonds, they've got gold, they've got timber, they've got um, uh, what's called coltan, which is a mineral that's used for making the little vibrators in in, in cell phones. Uh, there's all kinds of resources they can use to and that they can export. Uh, illicitly for a stream of revenue. And, and the Salvadoran rebels really didn't have that. I mean, this was really, this conflict depended much more on outside political sponsorship. And, and when that political sponsorship started to dry up, both sides had more incentives to settle. In contrast, you know, the FARC is still fighting because they've still got a source of money. Uh, and we've seen that happen in, with a number of insurgencies, you know, like in, in Angola, UNITA kept fighting long past it had any international support of any degree because they had access to, to riverbed diamonds that they could, uh, they could mine and export. Um, the other source of funding for the FMLN, and I think uh, fairness dictates that I mention this, was um, uh, it came from the United States, partly from the, the Salvadoran exile community in the US. But also there was a lot of humanitarian aid that came from church organizations and other groups in the US that went to humanitarian organizations in, in El Salvador, particularly for displaced populations and refugees. And uh, uh, one strongly suspects that the FMLN managed to lay their hands on some of that money. Um, there, because there were so many Salvadorans in the US, there was also a kind of logistical chain that connected the US to El Salvador. Um, there was a sort of a business, for example, in buying salvage cars in the United States um, and uh, shipping them in, in big trucks through Mexico to El Salvador, where they would then be rebuilt in body shops in El Salvador. And this was a big business. And a lot of the cars on the road in El Salvador were cars that had been wrecked previously in the US, rebuilt at low labor cost in San Salvador, and then resold. Yeah, that's the kind of car I had when I was down there. It worked fine, you know. But there's a pretty good chance that when it came across the, the, the border, it weighed more than it was supposed to, because uh, some of these car uh, trade operations were, 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 were concealing weapons and ammunition in the cars. And I observed a number of, of, of at some of the demobilizations, um, a number of the, the weapons that the uh, rebels had were, were semi-automatic assault rifles of the versions that are sold commercially in the US. Um, so there's a certain amount of their armament that was actually coming from the US in, through clandestine chains. It's kind of interesting. So it's <laughs> internationalized war in multiple ways. Other, yeah, other questions? Not really. Not really. I mean, the control over the negotiation was pretty centralized with the FMLN. Um, and you know, there were provisions made for, uh, for, for uh, repatriation and uh, uh, you know, amnesties for people who had criminal charges against them, who fled, you know, related to the political charges against them, related to the conflict, et cetera. But yeah, it was. Uh, it's kind of left to UNHCR, the High Commissioner for Refugees, to organize returns. Uh, and there were a number of mass returns where a bunch of people got on bus convoys and came home. Uh, and the UNHCR was very involved in trying to orchestrate that. And ONUSAL helped with that in terms of making sure that conflicts didn't break out when large groups returned. Um, but it wasn't something that was kind of formally incorporated. It, it varied a great deal. Yeah. I mean, 
there were a lot of, a number of people who who's who, who never recovered their land because it basically had been de facto appropriated by others after they left. And you know, one of the things that Onasal field offices did was they were constantly trying to adjudicate those things and help help people get alternatives. Um, in a number of cases, they were able to persuade the government to to provide land um, in other places so that you wouldn't have to have a one-for-one one, uh, tug of war between the person who fled and the person who occupied the land. Yes? I found it very interesting that uh, when you asked the question, how is it possible for a military government to be negotiating for democratic reforms in 1991, I guess, when they started the talks with the FMLN? Well, I mean, it was a civilian government, though. That's the thing. Yeah, I mean, it really was, I mean, um, you know, it ha I would say it was it hadn't, and through the 80s, it hadn't been really very democratic in the sense that the military was always the power behind the throne, so to speak. Um, but, but they were civilian elected governments. Uh, uh, so and, that makes and, it more and so, they, yeah, because they had, yeah, and this is how, that's how Arena had the, the autonomy to do that. So that's why the electoralism is so crucial because it, it you know, initially, you know, people kind of mocked the elections in 82 and 84 as kind of showcase elections, you know, because it's like basically the Democrats in Congress were willing to sign off on military aid for El Salvador if there was progress towards democracy. And so, you know, the administration said, okay, you have to hold elections. So they held elections. And initially, it really was just for show. But then it started to have effect. You know, it started to create a more, a, a more of an autonomous civilian space where, you know, power really did derive from elections. And that was critical because it gave the, the, the representatives of the upper classes the idea that, hey, we can just win elections. We don't need the army. And that's, and that's the condition under which, combined with the result of the war and the final offensive in, in November of 89, all those events sort of combined to, to lead the business community and its leadership and its representatives in, in the government to be willing to sell out the army, basically. Yeah. And I have a question uh, from the reading in terms of terminology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, there must be a political science. It's very, it's, it's, yes, yes, it's political science jargon. And basically, there's two different meanings there. I mean, you know, lib liberal democracy, I mean, we mean, um, you know, freely held elections with, with civil liberties, freedom of assembly, et cetera. So, so, so democracy. yeah, democracy, oh. but, 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 Underline. yeah, un stressing that it's, um, you know, it, it's representative, there are formal rules, civilians really get to win office, if they lose, they leave office. It's that, those sorts of characteristics, all right? Then there's another meaning which I, we use liberal, which, which has to do with international relations theory, okay? Which is, which is basically interna liberal international relations theory is, is theory that focuses on the existence of rules, norms, laws, established practices among countries that constrain the sovereignty and independent action of countries. So, you know, whereas the, what we call realist theory kind of views the world, the globe as an anarchy, where, you know, nation states just sort of compete with one another and they're worried about survival. Liberal international relations theory focuses more on, on the fact that, you know, much of the time countries cooperate with one another. And much of the time they follow international law. And much of the time their interactions are actually ordered by and channeled through formal international institutions. Um, and so we're sort of drawing an analogy between that international relations theory and what the UN did in El Salvador, which was to sort of channel the competition between the rebels and the government through institutions, rules, norms, institutions. Other questions? Yeah, do you want to see some photographs really fast? Do we have till 2.40? Yeah. yeah okay. So let me just tell you a little bit about these slides. The first set of them uh, take place at a place called El Mosote, which was a, a massacre site in northern, in northern Morazan, which is in the northeastern part of the country. Um, and it's, a, it's an area where the, uh, the FMLN had a pretty strong presence, and they controlled it most of the time. And periodically, the army would go in in, 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 in these sort of raids um, and try to engage the FMLN. And in one of those raids, they basically came upon a village where a lot of people had concentrated from all the surrounding areas 
because they thought that village kind of had a little bit of an, of an understanding with the army and that they would be safe there. Um, and as it turned out, not so safe. Um, so, all right. Uh, you might, yeah. I think we should put the lights down because some of these are a little dim. These, these, this is actually, these are slides from film that, that I scanned, so they're a little bit. Um, so this is, this is the river that divides uh, northern and southern Morasan. The northern part was kind of FMLN controlled. Uh, here's a map just showing. So we're in the upper right-hand area. You see what, in the right-hand side there's San Francisco de Gotera. That's uh, north of there is, is where this massacre took place. Um, this is in 1981. Army troops came in. They found a bunch of people in this community called El Mosote. This is what the countryside looks like. Um, a year earlier, or like nine months earlier, they had, they had been ambushed in that area by the FMLN, so they kind of came in with revenge in their heads. Um, yeah, you can see this is really tough country to fight in. Imagine walking through this with 60 pounds of gear and ammo and whatnot. It's miserable. Um, this is where people farm in that area on steep hillsides. That's a cornfield, if you can imagine. No Iowa farmer would grow on that. All right, so these are the ruins in El Mosote. I'm going really fast. I'm sorry, but we're kind of short on time. Um, uh, these are ruins in El Mosote. This was actually a fairly prosperous place in 81 before the, before the, the massacre uh, took place. Um, so under the provisions of the Peace Accord, the Truth Commission established that they would investigate past human rights violations. And so they, they hired a team of consultants from Argentina where there had been massive human rights violations previously and where there was a strong practice of what's called forensic anthropology, where you basically go into a site and you excavate it and you find out who's there, whose remains are there. Uh, what you're seeing here is the, the, the remainder of the church there. It was an adobe structure. The roof was burned off of it, and like any adobe structure exposed to rain, it had kind of melted. And the thing in the foreground is the baptismal font, which has survived because it was cement. Um, and these are crosses that have been planted in this area, placed in this area by survivors. There's a little monument. Um, so what they're doing here is they're basically digging in, in an area that had been identified by, by a, 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 a surviving eyewitness who basically had been shot and had lain in a pile of bodies um, and not moved as the military walked all around her. And finally, when they left, she crawled out from under the bodies and, and walked out um, and gave testimony to what had happened. Um, and she described that, that much of the killing had taken place in this little house that was behind the church where the, where the priest would stay when the priest came, which wasn't very often. Um, and they, all these people had been crowded into that house and fired upon through the windows with machine guns, and then they'd set fire to the place. So they were excavating here, and the excavation basically had to be done with brushes. As you see, they have basically paint brushes and, and little dust pans, and they dug down through this layer. Um, and the whole time, the, the, the representative of the government uh, 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 forensic investigation office was sort of mocking them and saying, what, what do you think, you're in a museum? You know, get out a shovel, let's go. And they said, do you want us to destroy evidence? And they said, no, of course not. So continued digging with their brushes. And the day that I arrived, they had, they had uh, uh, started to encounter human remains, um, many of which were, were children, remains of children. Um, and so they had to be very delicate about it because the bones of children when exposed to heat from the fire tend to become very frangible and so uh, they were proceeding very cautiously and then once they had a load of the stuff they were actually running it through a screen very carefully looking for little bone fragments um, so as to identify the number of individuals. Now, these pictures are macabre, and they're disturbing to see. What's kind of odd is that the mood among the, the investigative team was sort of buoyant. Exactly. Exactly. It was, it was basically the mood among the people who were doing this work, which included Argentines and Salvadorans who were from, you know, professionals from the, the, the Office of the Medical Investigator, was basically, you can't freaking lie about this anymore because here they are. You know, here's the evidence. You know, it's exactly what the eyewitness described. Um, the, age, the age distribution of the victims was exactly as described. The number of victims, 
the bullets they were finding, the cartridge cases they were finding, it all conformed with what the eyewitness had, had said, and it completely contradicted the Army's story, which was this was an encounter between forces, and they had a firefight, and a few civilians got in the way. Well, if they got in the way, they happened to be in a building, and most of them were children, and they were burned. So it's not credible. Um, so, so that's, you know, it's kind of strange, but that it was the, the mood was happy, oddly enough, as they were encountering these remains because it's like, okay, now at least we're going to have the truth about this event. This was in 92 for a massacre that happened, if I remember right, in late 81. So they're screening, you know, what, what's left after they remove the bones, obvious bones and things from the from the dust pans. They ran them through a screen to see what else they might find, um, cartridge cases, projectiles, etc. And then they bagged it, they tagged it, they wrote down exactly what coordinates each item was found in on the grid system that they had over the dig, um, and the staff sat there sorting and typing up on manual typewriters. And in the far right, you see the judge. Oh no, the head. That's the head of the medical uh, investigator's office staying cool in the shade. He never left the shade. And his whole demeanor the whole time, th that institution during the war had basically covered up every military crime. <laughs> and his demeanor in this whole thing was very sour. He really didn't want to be cooperating. But his staff, the junior professionals, were really into it. And they were really into this opportunity to really have a big effect. And they were into what they were learning from the Argentines about techniques. Um, and so there's, there's this big generational divide between this guy who's kind of the old guard, sourpuss, oh, we don't want to find out about this, uh, let's, let, let's forget about this, and versus the staff who are really engaged with, um, with what they're doing. And I've been told to stop taking pictures at this point, so I'm sort of shooting from the hip. So that's why it's kind of skew -gee. That's the judge there. All right. So this gives you an idea of their process. Okay, so, um, and then they, they issued a report that, that documented very thoroughly about this, this uh, Massacre, as well as a number of other assassinations that took place, et cetera. And you know, their work on the government's on the on the violations committed by the government was actually very, I think, very well carried out. Um, it's just that it was not as balanced as it should have been. Now we are in western El Salvador, west of the capital. This is a lava field. There's a lot of volcanic activity in El Salvador. This is an old lava field uh, that was used as a body dumping ground during the war. So you know, during the war, it was not uncommon for, for people to show up at a bus stop in the morning and find a human head sitting on the bench at the bus stop. And the body would be out, out on this, at this place called El Playón, out, out west of the capital. And so people were always going out there when their loved ones disappeared to try to find their remains so they could bury them. Um, horrific, horrific uh, area. Um, so. Um, I'm about to show you some pictures that are from, uh, let's see, this area up here. Let's see, San Salvador here. So up in this area, uh, northern Chalatenango was one of the rear guards for the, uh, the FMLN. And then just north of the capital city, there's an area called Guasapa, uh, which is a volcanic uh, a volcano uh, that's kind of right in the center of the country. And OK, yeah, it's just above a popa on that map. Um, and just to give you an idea of how small the country is, right now I'm taking this picture from Chalatenango, which is way up north. This is the rear guard of one of the FMLN groups. And if you look at the picture, um, you can see this sharp volcano here. That's the San Salvador volcano, and the capital city is right there. So from the re one of the rear areas of, this, of the uh, Salvadoran rebels, you could see the capital city at night. And that's how close it was. It was maybe a three-hour drive. Um, very, very compact country, which gives you an idea of just, you know, kind of what a strange conflict this was. Um, and then on the left, the mountain that's sort of on the left is Guasapa, which, you know, again, very close to the capital city. You know, it's maybe 60 kilometers away. Um, so here on the, on the slopes of Guasapa is one of the encampments of the rebels during the deep mobilization process. This particular group, there were five groups in the FMLN, this particular group, it's called the FAL, they were the Communist Party. Basically, the old Communist Party kind of belatedly joined the fight and created their own uh, armed, armed group. Uh, and they were actually um, very proficient, a bunch of math majors from the university. They busted the, the, the military's codes. They breached their <laughs> communications. And, and uh, they were a very effective group. 
Um, these are some of the soldiers uh, preparing for demobilization. You can see they're starting to relax a little bit, <laughs> eating ice cream in the camp, hanging out. Um, uh, this particular group is not from the FAL. This is a group uh, from uh, one of the other groups called the ERP. They were kind of an urban command that had been operating in the city, and they had never concentrated. And the UN said, wait a you know, we know that you're fighters, and so you need to go concentrate. So they put them in this camp that was mainly for another group, for FAL, uh, and they had them, de had them demobilize. Um, and you can kind of see the, you know, the UN accoutrements here. They've got their jeeps, they've got their helicopter, they've got their communications system. Um, and you know, this whole demobilization process depended on the UN basically providing early warning. So the FMLN had their weapons, and, the, and the, the, the UN would do unarmed patrols around the area. They would fly their helicopter. They would basically ensure that no army troops were coming anywhere near the rebel forces. Uh, there was one instance where a patrol approached a, 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 an FMLN uh, uh, encampment, and the UN basically went out and met with them and you know, just, just like went and told the officer, you are not going to come into this area. Because you know? if you do, they will shoot at you, and we will get out of the way, and this war will start again. And they went, oh, all right, you know, and they backed off. Uh, and there were a few other instances with overflights of helicopters and aircraft, but mostly it went really well in the UN just by patrolling, reassured the rebels that they would be safe. Um, as you can see, there were child soldiers in El Salvador, not very many. This kid's uh, parents were killed in the war, and so the, the unit, one of the units just sort of took him in, and he became, he was like a runner for them, and um, they handed him a cut down M16 and made him a soldier. Um, so this is their, going through the demobilization process. They kind of went from desk to desk, and they got their voting credential, and they got their paperwork showing their, their entitlement to education, and uh, they made decisions about whether they were going to you know, get agricultural benefits or industrial benefits, what package they were going to get. Um, they got fingerprinted and registered, and their personal ID documents were prepared for them, et cetera. The officers on the left are the UN, those are UN officials from various countries, Venezuela, Mexico, Brazil, Spain. The gentleman there in the light green shirt is a lieutenant colonel from the Spanish Armed Forces, and he's addressing the 12-year-old with the usted, the formal form of Spanish, <laughs> respectfully, as he should. Um, yeah, as he should, but I just, I just thought that was kind of cool, you know, it was like, it was very formal. Um, didn't differentiate at all, no, no condescension, maybe because the kid had a gun, I don't know. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this guy is like four foot nine, carrying an RPG. Um, uh, quite a few women in this particular unit. Uh, it was a little less common in some other units, but this urban unit had, had probably a quarter of the combatants were women. 